So today, we're going to do our second lesson. This is a wonderful other oh, this is a, This is actually where Chris and I spent the first year in Mexico in this area, where the Sea of Cortez meets the desert. It kind of looks like Sedona. And it's very hot, even hotter than here. So it was 114 many times during the day. <laughs> but we just love We just love this area. And I wrote my set of Planet Mercury Rising book at this location. So wow. on my birthday, Chris took me out to stay and kind of get my head chilled out because I was just finishing the book. So, so that's a <laughs> to share with you. So I'm replacing it with my girl. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's go quickly over what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a quick intro. Uh, I want to focus on the fact that higher consciousness is the lost goal for humanity. Now you realize from the Garden of Eden, Enel didn't want that, so those two are part uh, at odds relative to our experience on this planet. Uh, real quickly go over uh, some of the stuff in the beginning. We covered most of that basis stuff in the, in the first lecture about who the Anunnaki were and all, all of that. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit in depth about our construct and how they designed us, which I put a little bit in the first book, but this one uh, we're going to get a little deeper into it. Then I'm going to do a brief overview of the key points of animal cabinets. There's 15 of them with a lot of data there. Um, how many How many feel pretty comfortable with animal tablets so far? I know I've got an audio, I've got to do my book. Okay, so I'm only going to go to some of the key points. Of the bullet points for the other information will be there. You're welcome to read it, but the ones that I've highlighted are the ones I'm going to focus on. But make sure we get it, okay? And then I'm going to add something a little different here uh, called light encoding the reality matrix. This is some very deep physics for how it interacts with the human body and our potential to manifest matter. Are you know, in, in uh, Tibet and other areas of the world, there are supposedly people that can do this. Well, there's some science behind that. And there are a couple of scientists that actually have written this paper that I have, and I'll share it with anybody who's really interested. And actually looked at this from a physics standpoint and wrote a, pa wrote a paper on it. I summarized it and showed you the mantra that I particularly developed for myself based on how sounds resonate with me, and I'll share that with you. It takes a lot of practice and debate. Part of it is establishing a practicum so that you can get to the place where you can do that. Now, have I been able to do it yet? No, but I think I'm getting close. And I'm going to keep working at it, and Krista is as well. So she has her own or what we call light encoding the reality matrix mantra, and I'll go over that with you guys. That was not in my uh, second book, but I realized it was so profound that I wanted to share it with you. We'll real quickly go over some alchemy, uh, how it related to the fall and his first mission as he went to Egypt, the first alchemist. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about virtual reality <laughs> and start making you think about what kind of perception and holographic state that you truly are in. And I think by the end of this, you might be convinced that what Paul said is true. Okay. Uh, we'll real quickly go over so what's happening in the world and the forces that are arrayed against each other and where we're probably going to land in very quickly. Some of the oppositions to that new world. Remember we talked about the rising of the new Atlantis that was always meant to be in the, and it looked like they chose Washington DC. And we'll look at some of the things that are going back and forth. And you'll probably be able to see the headlines a little differently now once you realize that. Uh, some of the things that are happening in terms of alternative energy, a way that we could possibly live in a sustainable way on this planet without overpopulating and utilizing all the resources. I don't know if any of you have worked with Jared Knight's work, Dr. Jared Knight. He wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, and he also wrote a book called Collapse, where he looked at all these civilizations and what went wrong, including the Mayans and all the others, to try to analyze what, what generically is going wrong here. So it's interesting. There is a solution to that. And then uh, breaking out the city. What do we have to do to ascend out of this perception of call that Thoth says we were born into? And, and they call it the illusion of uh, Maya. 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 It's interesting that word means illusion in that religion. So, <laughs> so a lot of uh, spiritual disciplines agree with that. Okay. Okay. So why did I why did I write this book and why did I adopt false perspective? Well, now you realize back in the Numa Illish, Mumu, which was Mercury, was involved in this 
allegory of this battle of these planets that were coming into collision in close, close perigee of the sun. So he goes way back along with his father, E.A. Newton, who was Andy in that reference. So I saw him from the very early stages of uh, our introduction to ancient history all the way up to even through Egypt and even to now. So it's like, well, how is that possible? But um, there were several reasons why I chose him instead of Enki, you know, Zechariah Sitchin was the lost book of Enki and gave the whole perspective of what went down on this planet while they were here from his perspective. But I, I really felt that because of his mission, I wanted to take his perspective and write this book. Right, so that's why I did that. He was uh, a geneticist of the Sumerian camp. We did the genetic upgrade. Uh, he also played a liaison role with his brother Kibuzi, both sons of Enki. To, the Adapa and Lee Honig on the river. Amazing story. I think that's in my chapter three or four of my book. Has everybody read that? That part? Remember that part? And also, as he left to come back to the earth, he was told a, a specific part of his mission was to be managed. Oh, that's very important. Cool. Yeah. He also correlates that with his self proclaimed mission in the Adapa. So we have corroboration of what he was told and what he also said that he was going to do. I'll talk a little bit about, I didn't even know about the deal of alchemy when I started writing this book very significantly. So as it started unfolding in our lives, it became more and more clear that this process of transmuting lead into gold or a hairy barbarian into an ascended being is exactly what he was trying to describe and that was his mission. And then I'm going to show you some of the synchronicities that happened right after I wrote my first book that spawned me to probably write this thing. And choose this title. So, from the Enuma Elish, you realize that the, we live on this half the planet, according to the Anunnaki, and Mercury is another name for Nimshia. So, in my opinion, the reason I chose this title was he was ascending to take over this Lord of Earth command, and I hope you'll be convinced by that. Okay. We talked about uh, a couple of these old documents that were very, very important to me. Um, he shows up in the uh, New Mediolith significantly and also in the Audra Hayes. Both of these documents are on display in museums if you can see that. So I think that's kind of neat. You can see it clearly there's going to be some missing lines and things like that. Whenever these things are broken, and a lot, a lot of times, at least in the Oxford University, they would, you know, they would tell you how many lines were missing, so you knew mm -hmm. that, that there was a piece missing. And maybe you could get it from another. Other than an old Babylonian or Macadian perspective, and so a lot of times they'll give you those. And, uh, that's why I like uh, Stephanie Dalton's book. She did that. I think I have a table here of all of the planets in our system and the names that were ascribed to them by the individuals. It really helped to understand this allegorical battle. Are you okay? Yeah. There's a spot over here. There's a spot over here. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, I mentioned uh, this encounter on Hathor's Temple in exactly the Exodus 30 20, where the smoke was coming out, right? And Moses goes up and meets God and comes out with Hathor's Well, it turns out in Hathor's Temple they discovered that they were smelting gold. It's right there on Mount Sinai. You can go look at the tree and look at that. Hathor, to me, is a non. And uh, clearly, El Shaddai was another name for he of the high mountain who was Enlil. So Enlil and Hathor, or Nana, were there in this temple when Moses had this account. So the, the idea that Lawrence Gardner got the access to information to disclose what they found in that temple, which is this white talcum white powder underneath the stone of the floor, that were being used to compose conical bread cakes that the priests and the ritual attendants were consuming, they had to ask yourself, what are they doing? <laughs> Right? Then Moses comes down and takes his gold cap and does exactly the same thing. The Israelites trying to wake him up. Well, he must have been exposed to this idea of the alchemical trans transformation of gold into something that not only affected the pineal gland, but also was affected the intelligence. Okay, and that's, so we, we, we use the word star power gold for that reason. As soon as I wrote about it, 
everybody in the world was asking us, well, how do we get it? What's, you know, what's the best source? So we started doing the research. Uh, it took us a while to find the right source, read David Hudson's patent significantly. I studied it for quite some time. And I've written a lot of patents, so I, 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 you know, that's something that I do, but probably most people wouldn't. <clears throat> so we started making our own. And eventually, because of our traveling arrangements and being on travel, having to get to the post office, ship this one, we finally uh, handed get some of those functions off to somebody in the United States to help us with it. But Chris still uh, has a couple of different uh, alchemical products that we sell. And, and, she, and when we get a chance, she can talk about those. I think we have a product left. Uh, we also ended up uh, producing colloidal silver as a result of uh, some of the other scares, like the bowl and HIV and things that were going on, chicken and good. Um, Alchemy is interesting, and I'll talk about this in some of the books. And, and this ties back to some religious tenets, that, or whether it's with Buddhism or Hinduism, uh, especially Tibetan Buddhism. One of the primary uh, aspects of that religion is number one, serving nature is good. Okay, well, that's just the opposite of the way we're taught to live in the Western world. You know, uh, everybody's watching, uh, uh, what is it, uh, what's that? Singing competition. American Idol, American Idol. So everybody wants to be famous in the world. Well, this is, this is a completely the opposite of what, what uh, is required to have an alchemical uh, initiation, if you will, as you see later in the document. And also, what does that mean, purifying your conscience? Does that mean stop swearing and don't chew tobacco? You know, it was different for each person. But in general, if you're doing anything that's tempering your energy body instead of enhancing it, you're probably not purifying. So, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. And it's, it's somewhat different for most people, but I'm surely not going to be putting on some dogmatic rules you can do this and stuff like that. I'll tell you guys at the break what we do and what we don't do. That's part of that. And the reason I chose this spot for this conference was because of the significant tie in to Quetzal uh, Kuala, which right, was another name for Paul. And I think after seeing one all this stone in Zappa and realizing the signs and symbols on there, uh, hopefully you will be as convinced as I am that this entire Mayan civilization came and the calendar and the language came from law, just like it did in Egypt, just, just like it did in Mesopotamia. Uh, Mercury is a really neat uh, liquid metal. Has anyone ever had a chance to see it up close to Mercury? You have. Actually, I have a original story about Mercury that uh, they used to use the cinnabar to leach out the mercury from it and then stain, they would stain uh, material and make hats out of it in, in, in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that close exposure to mercury when people were wearing these hats, they used to get what's called mad hazard disease. Mm -hmm. It was because of the mercury in the center. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing liquid metal. It uh, absorbs light, it doesn't reflect it, and it will absorb pretty much any metal that comes in contact with it. So they used to use it for leaching out gold from uh, the mining operation. So we found lots of mercury around places, even here in Mexico and down in uh, South America, where mercury shows up in rivers when they're using it to process gold. And who knows what else? Maybe mamas, toroids, and plasma flying with bicycle. But it is an amazing property, and it's quite interesting that Ningxia, Mercury, Hermes chose that metal which is a significant component in the planet Mercury to affiliate his name with. That's Mercury, the Roman god. Right? I won't spend a lot of time on these either in my book, but this is something that's, I think it started about here where I retrospectively realized something crazy was happening to me on 9 1 2013. This is only a few weeks after I found my national radio show with George Norris. Uh, we were on our way up to meet a fan. I think he showed up here later, tell him right here. This fan had invited me to Truckee, California, because they were having issues with mercury being exposed to the water during their mining operations, and they were being with EPA and all this stuff. And so all these synchronicities around mercury kept coming up for me. And 12 of them came up day after day. So I wrote these down, and I was like, OK, am I supposed to write another book? What's going on here? And I really, in, in reflection, believe this was part of my initiation into the alchemical experiment, at least at the next level. So I was uh, having a lot of 
close feelings and uh, reflections and connections where whoever this Mercury being was, right? Well, yeah, like the she default. And later in the document, you'll see this is exactly how it works in his initiation. And those are all in like chapter six of the book, right? Put in uh, how many past and present. Does anybody remember this old car from Mercury Cooper? That was mm -hmm. my very first car. I paid $630 for it. <laughs> it was an olive drab, uh, crazy car, but the, the idea was Cooper on the front with the pop up headlights and a leather bucket seat. That, Steering wheel slide out of the way as you get in the car. It's really a neat thing. But that was my first car. Cool car. <clears throat> it was a cool car. I flipped it on the black ice coming home from work before I worked at a grocery store when I was 16. Uh, at night, going around a very slow port, about 20 miles an hour, like slow motion suicide, right? And <laughs> all of a sudden, the car started sliding sideways, went down into a ditch, flipped upside down, and a, there was a whole tether ball hole and a piece of concrete down in this ditch, went right through the hood of my car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't into it. The car was old. <laughs> the body and everything on this car was what we were working with. <clears throat> uh, one of my uh, fans actually drew this picture of Hermes Mercury uh, for me. We were talking about possibly this being one of the book covers that I looked at. So I thought that was pretty good. So, we talked a little bit about consciousness and stuff yesterday, but we the last time, but we're going to do a little bit more with it, deep including some definitions and uh, connections to your human energy body that I hope will help illuminate, or at least where I'm at with um, this. We know the Giza complex, according to Bob, is Plotinus. He talks about building it 36,000 years ago. So he said he left Atlantis 50,000 years ago in the intro, we'll get to that. Went to the land of Alcan, built the states of the Giza complex 16,000 years after he'd been there, which means it was 34,000 years ago. Okay, 30, 30, not finding 2,000 years where we are right now, so the atom all together comes up with 36,000 years. And when you look at the zodiacal house table that I rewound using the actual transit times, it turns out it's exactly 36,000 to 34,000 with a about 2,000 year slice in the zodiac. So, that, to me, is a very strong piece of corroborating evidence that what he said is true. A lot of people still believe that Sphinx and the Giza complex were built around 10,000 years ago. Uh, well, I, I, I tend to do that as well. Also, when you read his documents, that Giza complex was not a tomb for something. It was an ascension chamber, plus had other functions, energetic functions and things like that. Uh, and it's just a simple, superficial edifice on the top of the surface of the ground that indicated a much larger complex that we believe now fills the entire Nile Valley. This halls, Pimente, whatever it is, it's a very large underground complex. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of that from the evidence we had from Dr. Jim Perlock. I want to talk about the the tendency to buy it was uh, fake construction to maintain such a Right, right. Um, actually, if you look at the if you look at the sequence of crystals that they had in there, the way they were extracting hydrogen from water and then adding a particular electrical component, it, it, it does look like it was a form of the energy generator. But it was also a form of the one to the right, and also the um, so, the Emerald Tablets, as you'll see, they corroborate exactly what Thoth said his mission was as he was dispatched by the Dweller. We'll get to that. Uh, raising human consciousness, which was really interesting to see that the Sayu, Enki, our genetic creator, is telling his son to go to the land of Egypt and do this. And you'll see this right on the tablets. Um, Looking in the past, this new world order that's evolving is really the old world order in, in disguise, and you'll see that clearly. So this contrast of light and dark, it's been going on forever, and it's probably for our, the evolution of our consciousness. Um, also, when you look at governments and their control of chemicals and putting things on class, look, first of all, 
the idea of being on a planet where flora, flora grows freely all over, and somehow that one over there is not is illegal, where that term mm -hmm. means that this one is not, that's ludicrous to me. So the idea of controlling uh, access to things to change consciousness is very much uh, indicative of the kind of order that's, that they're asking for. It's this battle between the evolution of consciousness. We want slaves, the animal lights, or we want you to we want you to do work and augment you, but we want someone to jumpstart your evolution, but we're not stopping you from achieving the same possibilities that we're we're able to achieve because we share their genetics. And this is ancient perspective. Okay. So. Uh, Jeff, you have a question. I think that when you really dig into the animal tablets, you realize there's discussion, scientific discussion that transcend time, all time. I, don't, I have never come across information that supersedes this so far, except for more understanding about how energy and matter work with our body that wasn't really laid out in the documents. And that's why I created things like quantum encryption and coding. I don't know if you about, know about the different properties of light that have been discovered recently, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're just now scientifically getting to the place where we can understand the intermediate and all this stuff he's talking about. So I read the Emerald Tablets on the internet the other night, and there were numerous translations. So which one did you do? I took the one from the Crystal Links from Doriel, and I looked at some of the other ones that were out there. It's a good point, because some of the older ones have even different, different higher levels of detail. So uh, actually, I'm going to contact the, the, the people at the, that the White Brotherhood or whatever it is they're set up to with Doriel's Commissioning? Dorian. Yeah, well, he wrote a book as well. So actually, I want to go through all of his stuff as well. But yeah, it's, it's like an unfolding of how far, because according to him, they went down into the 1925, and where it was hidden away, did this translation, and then was supposed to have put the tablets back in the Giza complex. That's what he said. Oh, so without having money to get. Which one did you read? Um, older one? Translated by Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, see, there's. Okay, there's... I the, just read the highlights. I yeah, yeah, there was an emerald tablet that showed up in Europe around the Middle Ages. Okay, but it was only a single summary tablet, whereas the tablets he's talking about here, they were a total of 13. Okay, so, the, so I saw the, the summary one that Isaac Newton was decoding. It was very different than what was given out to us here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this... this, this uh, this model for a sovereign citizen versus the need for government. Of course, that's really a popular topic right now. <laughs> Put you on a dissonant list. But if you go back to Neanderthal times when people were living in caves, imagine with me for a moment that there's a threat coming in the cave. I don't care if it's a saber tooth tiger or just or, or another group of individuals that want that cave and want you out. Okay. So all, so suddenly you're in this fight or flight condition where the group has a decision to make. Okay? Are we all going to group together and deal with this, or are we going to take our strongest warrior and put him out there first and let him deal with that? Well, that, that's typically what happens in the world. We, we enroll a hero to deal with our issues, because we don't deal with them ourselves. Okay? So the idea of facing our fears is very important as part of this alchemical transition. Okay, We can't pawn off this functional issue in our evolution of our consciousness to the hero every time. We've got to be the hero, whatever that means for your path. So I want you to keep that in mind as you realize that do you need a government to protect you? Or could people be self-organizing to, in a sovereign way, meet all the needs that they have without selling out our rights and our freedoms to an organization that is telling us, no, you can't gather brain water on your roof in Oregon. Or you gotta have a smart meter that's gonna dumb you down, be like an operator to shut your other prison. You know, all the incursions into our free will state of being that is natural for us. And we all know that we, we should be enslaved. We can feel that. Um, this symbol is very important to me. And I <laughs> opened my big mouth on the radio at one point and said, in my particular opinion, based on what I know, I don't think there should be a cross on any building, there should be a judicious. 
a symbol of life, not a symbol of death. Right? They're very similar symbols out here. And uh, I think that was done intentionally by him. But then, as a symbolic gesture, the machine himself fell into the way. Higher consciousness is not going to be allowed on her watch. So, um, it's very controversial, and I understand that. But when you understand what that symbol means, it really represents the alchemical transition out of this particular state into a higher state. And if, we, if I haven't explained the caduceus well, when we get to a picture, I don't want to do that. Right? I know I've done it several times on the radio. And I did it before. And some of you have been to the pizza complex. I know you have. Anybody else? Have you? I hope it's still there. I'll look at it. Isn't that the case? I hear that. Yeah. So it's it's really a tragedy what's what's going on with destroying these ancient artifacts. Yeah, I hope it is still there. And, but but the attic really they built a big fence around it. You can't walk on. You can't have any access. Oh, well, it'd be if you put on ISIS. Well, first of all, it can't come on with fake pyramid. Well, <laughs> well, it depends on whether they get access to an energy weapon or something. Uh, I just saw that Russia's got 200 nukes on their biggest sub on the coast of Syria, and the United States yesterday I saw it in the news and moved in was it 20 nuclear missiles in Ukraine. Well, um, it's so, there yeah, now. that's Ukraine, but <laughs> it's there now. I'm actually, everybody you go, um, there's very, very few tourists. Really? Because yeah, of what's going on there? Yeah. Oh, by the way, yesterday I, I just saw also that uh, there was a new government just elected in Egypt as well. Now, it looks like it could be another puppet government under the, the petrodollar clan, but it's hard to say. Well, it's interesting to me what's going on in Egypt because this was Enki's old domain. The entire Africa to Nile Delta was the Enkiites clan area. So all, all the gods of Egypt, before all the incursions and the wars from the Levant up north of Hind, uh, that, was, that was all from the Enkiites. That's what I call them. They're sweet. Uh, okay, so I talked about this uh, point in the age of Leo, it starts about 36,000, it goes to about 34,000 years. This is, uh, this is the second rewinding around the zodiacal house using procession. And you can see the actual transit times of each of that point three of them. And I pointed them out right here, so there's 2291 years, 2292, 2129, right? so there's a different transit time. In an equivalence house model, each one of these would be 2160 years, not different. But if you go all the way around, you should end up with 25,920 years, which is what they call the great year. So in the tablets, I just want to point this out once again, that in the age of Leo, the snake's body was aligned, and the face on there was none of them and she is. That was false face on it, according to him. There's a little picture of somebody put together the functional uh, interpretations of how the complex might be being used. Uh, there's lots of theories on this. It got very controversial when Graham Hancock went over and the Dr. Kyler was a boss. I saw this on video. Oh, no. You walked out of the room. I know. It was actually, it's like, like it, was, it was so childish. It was so childish. I couldn't even believe it happened. But yeah, so <laughs> the reality is that there's some serious mysteries. There that have been suppressed by the Egyptian government. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I have it in here, but in my book I talk about this guy, Dr. Jim Burkhoff, who did this film called Chamber of the Deep that's not been released yet. And he talks about finding all this underground uh, structures, just like Paul said, that all had an Atlantean writing and took it back to the original civilization. Now, when you read the other tablets, the dweller sends Paul to the Atlantean camp. That's why he was the first owl chemist. And so it corroborates exactly. He had the origin of Atlantis. So this Atlantis rising concept is very powerful. And it turns out Zechariah Sitchin was the editor of a magazine of Atlantis Rising. Did you know that? He's not Atlantis. Wow. So he knew. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, I, I, I need to go back, but it was a mystery to me about who Osiris was. For a very long time. So the Isis Osiris Horus story, this story that's told you, very important. Uh, now we, we know who Isis was, that was in uh, We didn't play, had a lot of clarity on who Horus was, really. We knew he beat Seth in his area of battle, but who was Osiris? Very important, one of the most important 
gods in Egypt. And he's claimed to be the one who guarded the Nuak portal. So if you do have an out-of-body experience like Paul teaches, you want to ascend to visit a higher dimension, but this person's going to be the one standing at the gate testing you. And so it turns out, and this is a really crazy concept, that Osiris is none other than Thoth himself in another avatar body. So Thoth is Osiris, and you'll find this out from, uh, if you study the Magus card in the tarot. He's holding the exact same scepter and all, all the same functions. I'm like, wow! <laughs> so that was very illuminating to me. Probably not a lot of people know that or believe that, but I personally do. And you see, and I'll show this to you in the deck. So there's a new sheet of space. Oops. And uh, they're racing the same. So there was his face. Of course, the, the snake that used to be on there broken off. But uh, of course, Napoleon over there was shooting artillery at the <laughs> so they've done reconstruction and all kinds of things, but there's the face of Nishida on this lying body in front of the temple that he said he pulled. Uh, there was a single emerald tablet that showed up in Europe about the middle 80s. It was talked about with various people in the but it was just a summary, and I did look at that as well. It was very, very short. It looked like two pages. It was nothing like the... the and Doreal has a book out that's... Uh, for sale on Amazon, I just looked at it, that has the complete emerald tablets in it. So those are the original emerald tablets? Well, this is a emerald tablet. Okay. That was, looked like it was a summary that ended up in Europe. So what's with the, the chain next to it? Is it dangling on something? Yeah, it looks like they had it. Uh, so they did hang it up or something. It's a gift shop. Yeah. Is it a keychain? Would you spell Doreal? D-O-R-E-A-L. That was very important to connect me to what Anu said when Muzi and Nishida would accompany this first being that Enki created so that his father could determine, well, what did you create here as a slave? You know, send me his design constraints, let me meet him. Is he smart? Is he smart? So that whole tale is really crazy if you haven't read that. Uh, wait a minute. So, but the fact that Thoth was sent back, Muzi was held back for a star. Then given the seeds of uh, domestic crops like grains and wheat and stuff, and the essence of a ewe, meaning domesticated animals, was sent back with the Muzi at that very area of the Fertile Crescent according to this document. So, but Thoth was sent back to deal with raising the consciousness of these beings, that, or, be the, or at least establish a priesthood to raise the consciousness of these beings that they needed. So this is part of the jumpstart process, right? They wanted to be slaves for a while, but apparently Andy had plans for them to be unenslaved because he designed in us the same arc, uh, constructs that would allow an energetic reaction and, and, and the evolution of consciousness. Well, well, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. When we get to the hotels, he talks about the history of them, where they were placed, why they were put back, and what they were put back. Yeah. Well, apparently they were made of a substance that was impermeable to destruction. The cold beta bonds couldn't be broken. The weak nuclear bonds were impervious. Very mystery, mysterious, if that's truly the case, how they were amazing. But only a really master alchemist would have been able to come up with something like that. And also the mystery schools, there were 12 of them that along the Nile and Egypt, and Loth was the progenitor of those schools, and that was his mission. Raise human consciousness. Now think about it. Now just go a little bit north of the Lubon and where in Mesopotamia, where Enlil drew lots and ended up in that region. <clears throat> you know, he was only interested in slaves, not beings that were evolving. And then just to the south of Egypt, all of a sudden, Thoth is doing just the opposite, <laughs> uh, right? And uh, so they were at odds about the role of the primitive worker. A couple of really neat things to tie in uh, our current understanding of energy and our our place in the solar system was uh, a discovery of a third Van Van Elmfeld that I included in my book. Well, this is dis discussed as these zones <coughs> that you can access at, in your energy body. So think about <coughs> think about the think about the uh, space travelers that supposedly are going out and exposing themselves in a, in a craft. 
through these high energy fields uh, with a little, you know, a, a, a little thin wall to abandon this energy. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of whether we can truly take a crap and, and go out with that. There's people that believe that because of the intensity of this radiation, that there's no possible way we could have gone to the moon. Is it true that in the 50s, the Americans um, applied nuclear weapons to the Van Allen? I have heard that, but I don't doubt it. I think they've done pretty much every destructive thing you can imagine. Yeah, it was kind of to destroy that. Yeah. Punch holes in it. Yeah. Well, the reason I point that out, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that this correlates with uh, some pragmatic knowledge from one of my heroes, Robin Bernaro, about what he called locales one, two, and three, as he was <laughs> leaving his body and experiencing these barriers. Well, it turns out the third barrier is where Voss says the new one is this dual dimensional entry point where you can leave the holographic prison that he specified in this sphere. Energetic prison. Okay. And the Emerald Tablets, I was just blown away when I realized that as I studied uh, the multi dimensional uh, theory, string theory, and then all of a sudden, Paul in his tablets had said exactly the same thing. Nine parallel dimensions, one dimension of time. This is what string theory says. This is why right the animal tablets are recording to you. you wrote this, you know, almost 50,000 years ago. So you're like, wow, <laughs> this is ancient knowledge and we're just now rediscovering this. Uh, I don't know, I, I talk a lot about out of body experiences, and that's probably a fringe topic for most people, but for me, that started happening very early in my life. And I never really question it, especially after I read Robert and Rose book, and was able to do it practically on command for many years of my life. Wasn't string theory, wasn't that Tom Hanks, or was that uh, Michio Kaku? No, it's actually a, another, well, whoever initiated the theory, and versus the people who actually wrote the mathematical papers to correlate multidimensional reality with string theory, those are the ones I focused on in my book, and I gave you all the data. Right, okay. Um, we don't truly understand the nature of life. We thought it was a constant, 3.08 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And well, is that through a vacuum? Is that through an optical fiber? But the density of the material, which is like travels through, determines whether it's going to travel at this supposed constant speed. Well, there's also other properties that come out with light. Uh, for instance, if you take a photon and look at it, you're going to have two polarization states. You have a spherical polarization, okay? And, uh, and then a, uh, there's an S and P polarization. I don't remember these guys right now. Anyway, uh, because, because of that, that nature of light, if you put on polarized glasses where it's kind of got lines oriented in a certain way so that certain wavelengths don't come through, you can block out light. Well, at the same time, you can take an S and P uh, parameterized photon and split those up at the, if they're from the same source, and those two pairs can be anywhere in the universe. And so if you change the polarization state of this one, it'll automatically change that one. So action at a distance all of a sudden just blows your mind relative to this, this knowledge. So what have they done? They've taken this knowledge and actually come up with a way where you can change an encryption key locally here, and because of the polarization state of the photons it's from the same source, that you could cause someone else to get anywhere in the gap, anywhere in the, you know, at no distance at all. I don't care if you're on the sun, it doesn't matter where you are. If that photon pair is there, it can automatically change. So you could actually transmit something in an encoded way from here to here, just using the polarization state of photons. And that's called quantum encryption, encryption keying. There are companies that have commercialized that already, believe it or not. And also, uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, there's a double slit experiment where ultimately I view light as the most unmanifested form of energy that can create any matter. So what does that mean? So if you observe it like a double slit experiment, it can go from a particle to a wave. And, and so the act of observing this unmanifested energy is a way of it saying, no, you're not allowed to observe me. I'll do what I want depending on whether you're observing me or not. That, in and of itself, from a physics standpoint, is a mind blower. <laughs> and that's been around for how long? So, if you get a chance to watch a YouTube video on the double slit experiment, it's, it's very, 
it'll change your perception of reality in and of itself. And for most people who've been through physics, it, it, it does that to it when they want to call it. Okay. Um, and this concept of time and the progression of the eventual convergence comes up in uh, the angle tablets that I talked about like that. I think we talked about the tools of the slaves, so you can skip that. Obviously, uh, Mercury's role was very significant in the New Maylish as he participated with his father. So the issues of uh, genetic chimera bring up the idea of our fate versus our destiny. So Enki actually, in the law book, had a section where he was discussing whether I have the intelligence to genetically create these chimeras to do my labor. But should I? You know, and, and, and if I'm going to enslave him to do this, <clears throat> what are the consequences of that? All right. So this pensive and reflective consciousness uh, exposed by him wrestling over this issue kind of gave you some insight into his character. He uh, he did not want us to be enslaved forever, but he wanted he, he needed a solution, and he was under you know he was really in a pinch to resolve this issue. This, this mission parameter that he'd been given. How's he going to accomplish this task? So imagine that you took a Neanderthal, jump started it with your DNA, got them just smart enough that they could do the work, but when the work was done, then what? You turn off the control frequencies and all of a sudden they go haywire. <laughs> you know, they're no longer being commanded because so they don't know what to do. What happens then? Well, actually, that happened to us, right? About 500 BC. So, uh, so that's a really deep topic to think about. In essence, in summary, from his standpoint, he viewed it as a genetic jumpstart. So that we got the features of Neanderthal evolving millions of years in advance at that time so they could do what they did. But at the same time, he did not want to see us being slaves. So this idea of slavery, apparently, according to the lack of law, is illegal. They weren't, they're not supposed to be slaves. But additionally, in the documents, if you read them, it's discussed that the Bury of Law didn't really address certain things about marriage and these kind of issues on other extraterrestrial planets. With that. So they were so they were playing kind of lawyers and dancing around these galactic laws in terms of getting their mission done and creating slaves. Uh, I, if you have read the other cases where Enki performs his rights takes us a dop up and then infuses his energy into this being. To me, that was the creation of a perfect animal. We talked about the genetic upgrade, so he did meet the labor needs. Uh, and then we'll talk about telomeres and aging and uh, some of these biblical lifespans that go from Adam to Noah. Uh, everybody, so I've been asked this on the radio before. Actually, the first show I did on George Nori, some guy called in and wanted to know about biblical lifespans and whether this was, well, those were really the months of my case. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I realize we got a lot of part of it. I believe we're all on our chimeras. Uh, the Mayan calendar, if you study it closely, in the nine frequencies and the rows, the, the rows that are distinct have a lot to do with frequency and consciousness. So all of a sudden, there's this energy and consciousness issue. Maybe Dean Leary, if you know about Dr. Leary, that specified that there were eight different circuits, latent circuits in humans that seem to be sensitive to either temporal or energetic triggers that affected human consciousness. And I put all those in my book. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And I actually, I'm in agreement with him now that I've seen the new lexicon and the DNA of the medic code for this junk that we didn't know about. I think it had a lot to do with uh, this circuitry that he's described. Is it too close in here No, I'm good. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, we talked, we showed Nancy's temple. Uh, I don't think we'll much more of that. But this revolving Samaritan kingship. Really, I think the penultimate example of that is the lamentation of Ur or Nanar, Sin, who was Allah, and Enel's son was the king of that city and you know, destroyed it. And what was really disturbing to me was that uh, Anu and Enel were working together in that account. So Anu did not have a very high opinion of 
slay it to anything that create. So I did make it there a little bit. And we'll talk a little bit about sacred geometry. Funny for me because one of my synchronicities, <laughs> one, of, one of my kids first got their email account. One of them chose Maximus Ruler for some reason, and the other one chose Moon Moon. Like, what? <laughs> what? Really? And they were, they were very young, they were less than 10 years old. So it's like, this is what I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> what are they trying to tell me? Here's those uh, planets from the new image. So I went ahead and put the rank according to what I believe I interpreted the new English and the numbers. You can see them seven in Earth. So lucky seven, right? Where did where that come from? Well, that's because it's the seventh planet. And that's why I named my book the seventh planet, Mercury uh, And then you can see here in the old Babylonian version, uh, Marduk can associate his name with where it actually replaced it in the account. There are other accounts where it's called Mbubu, but not Margaret. Uh, Margaret was a pretty significant self-promoter as far as I'm concerned. But there are the names of our uh, planets, and you can see that. Now look, Ani was associated with Uranus. Here's Nudu, this is E-A-N-E, another name for it is Nudu, and he's associated with planet Neptune, right? So Neptune and Poseidon were the same gods, right? So now you see why. So why would Nibiru quill? Well, because they were the last one in. And they counted from the outside in from apogee of their planet relative to, now imagine you're coming in in the opposite direction, retrograde orbit relative to the way our planets are going around. It gives you a mobile observatory to see everything that's going on, right? So, yeah. so that's why Zechariah Sitchin made his book in 1976, 12 planet. And is there any sense of the fact that 12 is on the bottom? Instead of up here, no. Just switch between the eyes. Also, that's an interesting thing. You can see Blue Moon and Mercury here. Apps that would be in the sun. Uh, Onshar and Keyshar were names associated in the genealogy table, if you look at the one that I have. Mm -hmm. They actually, some of those prehistory, pre the ancient history of the group, they have affiliated their name. So, I'll just kind of focus on the Baldwin region so we get through this, but in, in, in the New English, I'll try to summarize in two different ways. Blow by blow, like the tablets do, which is somewhat, uh, I don't know, it's confusing to a lot of people. But then I reinterpreted to try to tell the story in a more modern way so that we could understand it. But uh, there were problems with the sun's radiation and all these interplanet issues in this celestial battle this allegory of this battle that they describe of billiard balls playing with each other, okay? So, um, so here, you talk, look at what uh, Enki unfastened his belt, removed his crown, and took away Mercury's mantle of radiance and put it on himself. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? If you think about that, something was going on with the planet Mercury. Uh, it looks like he unmasked or shielded somehow and was playing with the energy of these planets to affect a gravitational or magnetic pull on their planets as they came through. So this really is a crazy thing to understand from a scientific standpoint uh, if you had just considered this to be uh, a myth. But when you look at it from a scientific standpoint, uh, there's things like that we can do today. Think about uh, Using a nuclear missile to blow up an asteroid that could be coming in and striking Earth, right? <laughs> like a sudden impact. Okay, so the relationship between Enki and his son and Sheba in this account turns out to be very important for me. It continues. Uh, I think we spend a little time talking about tools versus slaves. Clearly, they decided to be slaves. Uh, and here's some of the reasons why I think they chose them. 
they already demonstrated they're going to use these in GG at least for a SAR. They had 3,600 years to get to a white ambiguous thing. Right? Was it a logistics problem? It's not really clear why. It's clearly very high, highly technical and capable. Um, of course, you got to have factories to support those. Biological beings will self replicate. Then you've got the problem of overpopulating and possibly rising up against you. So, all these design constraints, Andy must have had in his head, head that he designed this. How do you uh, how do you keep the revolt happening in mean, the just like they did before? How do you keep them happy? Do you placate them with big houses, lots of food, make their life easy? You know, how do you keep the slaves happy? <laughs> and how do you still outperform the machines in many cases? For instance, think about the uh, rover that we sent to Mars. And it's very susceptible to the, to the radiation from the sun. Uh, the solar panel is going to be oriented right so we can charge the batteries. What if one of the batteries fails? Uh, all these issues that come up with trying to manage a machine versus a being that can be commanded either telepathically or with Motorola radio and say, hey, look at this rock graphic, get a sample of this. Biology still outperforms machines. Go watch a, a robotic attempt at playing soccer or these robot wars where they're trying to fight, but they're, they're still not as fluid and as capable of fighting. They're getting there. That's any, not their yet. Any guess uh, when the uh, uh, slaves became sentient? Were they sentient the whole time? Well, this, this brings up the question of were the slaves able to be communicated with through language? Was it through a frequency where they were all commanded at the same time and they were sensitive to this and their reticular activating system and their interface the electromagnetic spectrum. Some of this detail is missing. And that's why I spent some time on this uh, our primitive worker design to kind of go from well, what do we have that we know and work backwards. How could they have enslaved us or communicated with us and what happens if that can spring goes away? Right? So is the slave rebellion? <laughs> right? <laughs> Looks like it. So, uh, just imagine for a minute that we were free will beings and that we could choose our own fated steps in this order of reality. So what would our destiny be? You know, so the idea, are we destined to do exactly what we were designed to be and be slaves? Or or could we make our faded steps somehow interweave to a point where we achieve the destiny of maybe a, a hero or a higher self that was driving us from within? So these really deep questions about who we are, and where we came from, and where we're going is very important to people. So, so for instance, uh, in the synchronicity key written by David Wilcox, he talks about this kind of hidden hand that's uh, interacting with you in this order of reality to suddenly cross an aha moment where you might have had that in the past life where there's something that we all have experienced the synchronicity that we can't really explain. Could it be a hidden hand or a force that's guiding us in our faded steps toward the destiny that we all believe, each of us having an individual one, uh, is happening? And so a lot of people feel like that has happened in their lives. And when I had the from 9 1 to 9 12 level of synchronicities happening, I was like, this is very unusual. What's going on here? Like, I'm sure all this have experienced. Uh, and also go back to the idea of Enki designing us, knowing there are other extraterrestrial races buying for the resources off this planet, genetic, think genetic war. Could he have created an environment for these avatars? He created one, that means the rest of us are too. That, so that we're in, by definition, a constrained space to evolve because that was his intention for us. He had slaves, but he'd also set up an environment. He left the constructs for us to evolve. So under what circumstances could he have been a holographic simulator? So we'll talk about that a little bit. I know the idea of a hologram and a simulator probably is way out of the edge for you guys. Hopefully by the end of this, I won't be. And we'll, and we'll use our eyes to determine how it's slave we truly are. It's, it's a telling uh, feature of our, of our five senses. Okay. 
Did anybody see that movie? Yeah. yeah. Did you like it? Did you like it? I actually didn't see it again now, but I've written some stuff about avatars and other So, this whole idea of being able to take your energy and animate it in the body in this dimension or about these other dimensions, but uh, it does truly exist. It's possible. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can't get my hair very long. You're just deep in there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, um, as avatars, uh, we talk about what happened on Mount Hathor, so the temple, this introduction to Star Power and Gold. And in 2009, three scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering how these telomeres, these little hand caps on your DNA, are affected by cosmic radiation and such that causes us to age. So if these little pen caps start doing this, and start shortening like that, guess what? The cells that they produce are damaged. And that's what produces aging. So if you can stop that from happening, you solve the aging problem. Very simple. Okay? So there are people all over, longevity experts and people that are investigating this, and lots of people we've been across paths with since we wrote about Star Park Gold, <laughs> they're looking at exactly this. And this is and they're going out, having their telomeres measured, taking this supplement or this, and seeing what is effective. So it's, it's so this is real science though. If you want to stop your aging process, that's the best you're looking at. So Jerry, just real quick, you've heard about a thing called blue zones. Blue zones? Blue zones. It's these people that live to be over 100 years old. They're in these certain zones in the world. Oh, oh, like the Lipamba, places like that? Um, Longevity Valley in, in Ecuador. Wow, I've heard about those. I didn't know they called them blue zones. They call them blue zones. You, you're not a star, you know? It's not a, it's the yeah, yeah. Well, the well, well, you know, in, in, the, in the Bible it says we were giving intelligence a 120 year lifespan. Well, yeah. the Emerald Tablets say that too. It yeah. was designed to explain by Inky. So I looked around in my first book and I said, how many people live beyond 120? And I only, the oldest woman at the time that I found had lived to 122 years old, something like that, and she was from France. Yeah. So. These are all 100 plus. 100 plus. There's only one place in the United States, and that's. It'd so be interesting America. to see how many of them you can see there, 120 it's years. No millennia, California. Really? All places. And they have to place these in the States. No kidding. There's Costa Rica, there's one in Italy. Yeah. We do about 20, 20, 20, 20. over 100, and they're acting. Act I mean, they're not just like 100 mm -hmm. sitting on the porch, and right, like, you right. know, not really with it, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And they all have properties that have uh, it's an inconvenience living. They all have stairs. It's not like one level living. It's nothing like that. And they're no. not out there jogging and running. No. It's I bet they die. <laughs> oh, um, they all eat. It's very similar to diet. It's not a lot of meat, if any, at all. Beans and rice. Beans, and rice. beans are just crucial. Chris, did you, what was those two doctors who did that China study? That did the oh, you're talking research? about Dr. Uh, one of the guys from Cornell and the yeah, other yeah. Guys, uh, the surgeon. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Well, name. they discovered when they looked at the diets of these people who were living a long time, yeah. it was primarily vegetarian. Yeah. So, and very little meat, like yeah, maybe yeah. once a month. Yeah. yeah. But there's not like we're doing powerful with two layers. They put it down to a more state. It's Chris and I. It's a lot of water in the Right. So I, I went to the Bible and got uh, Adam and Noah, and this is the King James version, right? <laughs> All those good Baptists who that one. Anyway, <laughs> uh, actually I spent 14 years married to somebody who was Catholic too, so I saw that on the inside out. We, we had lots of discussions. Anyway, um, are these ages possibly real? Based on genetics. Based on genetics. Well, some people believe some, some don't. But I know some of them are very interesting. If you let read the lost around the like where I see it, position. Inside, so outside of Mexico City is Teotihuacan, where the largest pyramid, at least till this year, they found another one, was the Temple of the Sun. Okay, so this was the headquarters for all the other southern kingdoms that were coming out. And Quetzalcoatl had a very significant we're, still gonna, we're thinking we're going to do our next conference up there. But inside Mexico City, remember, it was built on a, a lake with these little floating platforms that they eventually turned into a city? That was 10 octave long. Okay. Well, if you look at the name Enoch, it's a lost book of Enoch, where he, uh, Lamech has this child, Noah, with his wife, and comes back after being over learning these building techniques in Babylon, comes back and finds out he's got a baby 
who's got long hair, blue eyes, and is speaking at birth and blows his mind, right? Did you see this in the Lost Book of Eden? Oh, we're reading about the birth of Noah in the Lost Book of Eden. Well, then you come to find out that Enki was involved and it was his kid. <laughs> and then Methuselah leaves and goes find Enoch to find out what he's supposed to do about this alien that's been born to his wife, right? And he tells him, and then he gives him the prophecy about Noah. That there's going to be this, and he's going to be a very seminal being, and there's going to be a blood coming, and all this stuff. It's right in the Lost Book of Enoch, I think. <laughs> Amazing. So when I saw that his age, when he was taken up to be with God and never came back, right? Was exactly the number of days in our calendar. I thought, well, how many interesting is that? <laughs> so uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, Methuselah lived the longest in 969 years. But that pales in comparison to what we saw from the, from the Sumerian kings. Let's look at the first king that was given kingship in Arithu. Alulim was given eight stars, which was 28,800 years. He ruled not how long he lived. But what kind of telling years did those guys have versus these biblical patriarchs? So it starts making you think about it after you see what's possible with telling years. But maybe these ages were not the thousand. Is that crazy or what? It just makes me feel like I got gypped. Well, we all got the, we all got this plant at 120 years. But yeah. now we've been exposed to the idea that maybe you can go beyond that. Do you want to go beyond that in this prison simulator? And also think about this. Imagine you live that long. How long would you wait to deal with stuff that was really important in your house? Well, I got another 900 years, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to be eating this until I get to that point, and I'm a death, and then I'll, I'll tip the food. <laughs> right? Well, you shorten the lifespan only this long. Guess what? you got to move like a, like a busy ant, no sleep, to get to where you're going. Okay? So it causes you to evolve quicker <laughs> as a species to right? Especially if you throw a bunch of hand grenades and trap doors and the rat maze over there. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> I thought this was funny too. Lamech, who was supposedly the father of uh, Noah, okay, he was married to a few models, and we'll see that in the geometry table. But it's quite clear that through this, this incursion by Yankee, who went to Sheru Pak, his half-sister's medical headquarters, and specifically stated in the law school that Yankee that he had an encounter with Bill Bonos and got her pregnant. It's right there in the document. Okay? So Enki is the father of Akrahasis Noah. It's very clear. It's also in the, uh, in the book by Stephanie Dolly, where she talks about these different names of Noah in the very beginning of it. She clearly ties it to, to uh, Akrahasis and Zia Sudra. And the same being that Gilgamesh went to meet in his epic was none other than Utnapishtim, who was Noah. So, anyway, so there's many of Noah. Now remember, after 600 years of being king, that's when the flood came in Genesis. Oh, we're going to talk about it. You guys want to take about a 15-minute break?